Um, so from, I think, um, in, from our end, we would really like to have the interpretation and we can t discuss with the organizers about uh, invoicing for the fee later on. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone that is connected here today. Um, desde Latindad también apreciamos que pueda, eh, pueda mantenerse la traducción y también sí. las y aliados del área francófona. I have prepared and for all the allies, all the speaking English allies. This uh, language today. And welcome everyone. I am Patricia Miranda from uh, Latindad, the Latin American Network for Economic and Social justice and you are connected today to this event uh, which is towards a fourth finance for development conference and ff4 democratizing global economic governance for the right to development and sdgs um, as you all have heard we have interpretation to uh, interpretation english spanish and french you may find it in your screen um, and finally, important, very important to say, this event is organized by the civil society FFD group, including the women's working group on FFD. And we also have uh, other co-organizers that have been very supportive in this process, the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, EURDAT, Justice, Ibon International, Latindad, Tax Justice Network, Africa, and the Society for International Development. It has been 20 years since the UN Monterey Conference took place, giving birth to the major consensus on the financing for development process with commitments on key areas of international financing and cooperation as a global response towards a fully inclusive and equitable global economic system. The COVID-19 two years ago only exacerbated the systemic failures that we all knew that were not addressed as committed during these 20 years. Today, the commitment and challenges of the final agenda are more important than ever. The 2022 FFB Forum concluded with states mandating the General Assembly to decide convening the next FFB conference. This space, another FFB, the FFB4, could provide the political forms that can stand on the global south to realize the right to development and advance to the 2030 agenda. We have several challenges. There are several commitments and they are not being fulfilled. They are not being even rightly addressed. So without introduction, uh, we have a fantastic and a very committed panel today, the FFD process, to present us the key challenge on FFD, but they will also provide us an overview of what are some of these key issues that we need to demand to our governments in this process. I, I am very pleased to introduce our our panelists we have uh, Shenai Mukomba from TGNA Africa and GATJ we have Yolanda Fresnillo from Eurodat we also have uh, Vitalis Meja from ROA Africa and CP Rodolfo Lajoy from Ibon International Claudio Fernandez from Gestos and Luisa Emilia Reyes from Equidad de Género from the Women's Working Group on FFP. So without introduction, I would like to invite, please, to Tomba. Chena Tax has been a real key issue to warrant only fiscal sustainability but social sustainability. What is the current strategy on tax justice and tax governance? Chennai, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Patricia, and thank you for the opportunity to, to bring this meeting. 
Um, so really just to kind of build off the, the you made with speaking, um, we hire various systemic reforms in order to address many inequality within, within the world. Um, happy to talk, you know, the current reforms that that's Tax Justice Network Africa, which is a member of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice has been working on. Um, as, as a group of institutions, we need to reform the global tax system um, as essential. Currently, global countries are losing an estimated $500 billion yearly due to tax abuse, and this is largely by, by multinational corporations. And the need to reform the global tax system to the fore. However, when you look at the that are heading this tax reform, um, this is largely spearheaded by the OECD inclusive framework. But when you take a look at the countries that are also responsible for a lot of tax abuse that we see within the global system, almost 80% of global tax losses um, are due to behaviors um, of multinational corporations that are situated within OECD countries. What's also particularly problematic when you take a look at around the global tax reform is being spearheaded by the OECD. Many developing countries aren't members of the inclusive framework. Particularly, for example, when you take a look at the African continent, half of all African countries are not members of the inclusive framework. And this is a particularly poignant uh, point because when you consider the countries that are most negatively affected tax abuse, statistic of tax abuse that developing countries lose ranges from about six to 13 percent of their GDP right and this is versus the two to three percent of the GDP of what this means is that developing countries need to be at the table having discussions about the reform negatively affected Developing countries have for a long time, in fact, over the past two decades, been shifting where it is that we're having discussions about reform of the global system from the OECD to the UN. Most interestingly, is a couple of months ago in May, actually, um, African ministers in Dakar endorsed a resolution um, that spoke to this need. So specifically, this resolution indicates that we need United Nations begin negotiations under its auspices on an international convention on tax matters. And so as an institution alongside the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, alongside Red de Justicia Fiscal, as well as Tafja, as civil society, we've really come together to support African ministers in this call to bring conversations around tax issues United Nations, where it's more likely to have a space where all countries can come to these discussions. And as I've mentioned earlier, much more importantly, developing countries can contribute to these discussions. The things that we think that a UN tax convention could do um, in terms of providing this or promote democracy framework um, by allowing a genuinely inclusive process that ensures that the interests of developing nations are represented. Currently, it's only the United Nations that provides a platform for conversations of this, of this nature. Secondly, we feel that by shifting conversations to the United Nations, you'd also initiate a process of harmonizing international tax agreements to eliminate their bias towards developed countries to the detriment of developing countries. Um, the Collaboration uh, between governments on tax matters in a fair, transparent, and accountable matter, um, manner. And this would enhance greater coordination and coherence between institutions, and then ultimately have tax issued, uh, issues administered under one framework. As an institution, as TJNA, as, the, as a member of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, we are calling uh, for an FFD4 because we that such a space could really help us begin to have discussions about shifting um, the, 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 the conversations about the reform of the tax um, system uh, to the United Nations. As civil society, we have been working um, closely along in this direction. 
also, in fact, started to post looked like and so we really believe that you know the need for an FFD4 could not be more urgent particularly as it could result in systemic reform as it speaks to tax um, tax governance thanks so much Patricia thanks so much Shanae for keeping the time and for bringing the, the most important and key issues on tax matters I would like to invite now to Yolanda Fresnillo from Eurodat and Yolanda, uh, well, I assume you will speak in English. Um, that has been one of the topics that are now on the top of the table and the top of the agenda after uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic. What are the key issues given that we have? Well, thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, gracias. Thanks, uh, everyone that uh, put together uh, this panel, and particularly thanks to uh, all of the organizations uh, pushing for this uh, global uh, assembly. So I think uh, sovereign debts keep mounting in, uh, in the global south, pushing many countries to the cliff of uh, debt default, uh, Zambia, Suriname, are uh, have already defaulted, but others like we would like Mozambique, uh, Sri Lanka, and, and, and cutting public spending in the dramatic context of increasing food and energy prices. Uh, this exacerbated for COVID 19, were exacerbated uh, with the additional borrowing during the pandemic uh, and the increasing. Uh, debt servicing costs, uh, pushing a rising number of the brink uh, the fall. We also have to consider the ongoing climate uh, emergency challenges, uh, together with, as I said, the increasing food, fertilizers, and energy prices. Not the war in Ukraine, but also boosted by speculative markets and and, and industry uh, greed, uh, the supply disruptions. In because of crisis in the global north, and these of global recessions uh, altogether cannot only lead to an unprecedented uh, humanitarian crisis, but also to worsen the already complex uh, debt situation in 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 many countries. Um, in the global south, but also by the cuts and the austerity. Uh, that this debt crisis is, there is no no doubt, we are already in a debt crisis in the global. Uh, you were asking Patricia for what are our calls in this situation. Uh, first, our analysis is that the existing international financial architecture is not fit fit for purpose. Uh, it's able to the, uh, a timely, a comprehensive. Above all, a fair debt resolution those countries. Work a twenty other proposals on the table, like debt uh, payment suspensions or debt swaps. They won't deliver on the debt cancellation for all countries in need from all creditors that civil society is uh, calling for. We know from previous crises that debt cancellation call works in, in, in situations like this. Immediate debt cancellation for all countries in need is the just solution that many countries uh, need because reducing debt payments, reducing debt stock uh, allows countries to increase their social spending and infrastructure. But not only debt cancellation is efficient, but it is also, it is also a just solution. Uh, throughout decades of colonialism and neocolonialism, exploitation of natural resources, uh, human capital, fossil fuel based growth and carbon emissions, the Global North countries uh, have acquired an enormous social, historical, ecological and climate debt to the people of the Global South. Today, these same rich nations are failing to deliver the system changes, but also uh, the uh, debt cancellation that countries in the global south need. I think the, the, the example in Pakistan this last week is uh, very evident of, of, of that, how a country like Pakistan 
suffering from uh, massive floods and massive human suffering from climate change they have, they have not created and having to uh, honor their debt payments at the same time uh, should be receiving uh, reparations from the global North countries and not paying uh, external debt. Uh, we know that the later we take action, the costlier the debt restructuring will be, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of human uh, lives. And we also know that voluntary approaches, particularly with private creditors, mm, it, it, they won't work. We, we saw with the debt service suspension initiative that the SSI that the G20 approved in 2020, how billions of dollars went to rich investors and financial institutions' pockets while impoverished countries were trying to fight a global pandemic in 2020 and 2021. So what we are calling for, we're calling for a rules-based debt resolution framework, a framework that is binding to all creditors. Uh, and these rules and their supervision need to apply not only for creditors, but also for credit rating agencies uh, and beyond in the, in the financial system. The solution needs to be systemic. We can't limit the response to partial and false solutions. So we need a reform of the international financial architecture including a create, the creation of a, a multilateral sovereign debt mechanism. We can't leave to the G20 or the G7, all creator dominated forums, uh, that they let go the power they have and deliver on fair solutions. That won't happen. As Chennai was saying with the uh, tax discussions at the OECD, most global South countries have been excluded also from discussions about, uh, debt, uh, about the responses to the debt crisis. And as the saying goes, if you're not on the table, you're on the menu. And this is what is happening today. So we need a more inclusive and truly multilateral dialogue uh, to deliver these origin and systemic solutions, uh, including this profound reform of the debt architecture uh, without a multilateral debt resolution framework that actually puts human rights, gender equality, and the fight against climate and emergency over creditors' claims and interests. Uh, there won't be debt justice, there won't be economic uh, justice. Uh, so we need a truly multilateral and inclusive process to discuss and decide about, upon this new debt architecture that can deliver a timely and fair uh, solution to debt crisis. And this is precisely why we need uh, FFD4. As Chennai mentioned, uh, and it's also true for the debt architecture reform, only the UN offers an inclusive discussion and decision-making forum for all countries, including uh, borrowing countries, not only creditors. And only a decision-making process within the mandate of the Addis Ababa agenda and in the form of a new uh, Finance for, the Le for Development conference can deliver on such reforms. So this is why we are also calling from the debt movement for the FFT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yolanda, for all those key points that we are pushing from the debt movement, movements, hardly and for so long. I would like to invite now to Vitalis Meja, uh, but I don't see him. Vitalis, are you connected? Okay, while he connects, I would like to invite Rodolfo uh, Lahoy from Even International. And Rodolfo, the private, the private sector role seems to become in the last years very important for this process, but with many risks and with, and with many concerns for our countries in the South and for our calls from CSOs. Rodolfo, please talk to us about the private finance current situation, concerns from our side. The floor is yours. Thanks, Patricia and colleagues. Um, I'm calling from Manila, so I hope you can indulge me in beginning my thoughts with a brief historical note. Um, just to say that today, September 21, 2022, marks 50 years after the deposed Philippine dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr. declared military rule in the country, a day which is now commemorated by social movements 
as a time of remembering but also continuing the struggles for social justice. Um, the aforementioned Marcos dictatorship was notable for the backing of the IMF and the World Bank Group and along the way, the imposition of what we now call neoliberal policies of deregulation, privatization, liberalization in the Philippines. And even after the dictatorship was ousted in an uprising in 1986, that reliance on northern private capital as a policy trajectory has taken even deeper roots you know, in, the, in the country. So why do I open with this brief detour? Um, I realized as I reckoned with this historical fact today, I realized that the neoliberal, neoliberal version of that reliance on increasingly volatile private capital has been implemented in my country for at least four decades already. And then I also realized that in a bigger scale, especially in the global south, we have had this major challenge that the same policy dogma has been promoted, especially by the IFIs and states for a similar length of time. And this reliance on private capital has been tried and tried and failed. It has just taken new articulations as it adapted to crises and policy contexts. For instance, from the discourse before of direct privatization, we emerge to the discourse of public-private partnerships, later on to the World Bank's idea that private finance should be primary in financing development, even to the idea in the OECD and other donors that we should use scarce financing to catalyze private money, and behind all that, the idea that the state should be merely there to de-risk capital. Now, even today with rising inequalities and ecological degradation, this reliance on glo global private capital, global private finance is still the norm, despite unequal and corporate character of the recovery today. We, have, we are seeing the branding of so-called SDG bonds and um, the seeming idea that financial technologies can be used as panacea almost. Um, to address inequalities, but we see the real risk of rising interest rates and the market volatility that really undermines these so-called solutions. And these false solutions, as we like to call them, are all based on pre-pandemic norms that are tied to profit, despite the ESG washing twist, right? And they tend to drive wider and wider inequalities. They show more risks while keeping their benefits unproven to this day. So at, as CSOs and as a member of the CS, CSO Financing for Development Group, we see that these so-called solutions actually just obscure a more basic reality. The corporate capture of development, where you even see in the UNGA um, events like investment forums, for instance, currently the reality of the global neo-colonial integration into TNC-captured production networks. And from where we speak in 2022, which is another turbulent time to say, I think we should ask, should it not be a, a real change and real, uh, real ambition? Because it could be, our time could be actually of, of, of opportunity to call for process that could lay the ground for address all those systemic barriers Therefore, that there is a need to commit to an FFT4 at the UN level, one that is inclusive and will put um, strong southern voices in decision making so that we could raise the questions of relations, push, push systemic shifts, global economic governance, and more importantly for us, stop false solutions and downgrade these private finance first approaches. So, in this way, we have a chance to put forward real solutions, right? Um, addressing the systemic barriers to public resource mobilization, um, to regulate and prioritize public finance as a more accountable and sustainable modality of financing development. And this way we can enable sustainable industrial policy and agriculture in contexts of more democratic development planning, you know, where we can ground the contributions of domestic enterprises in southern economies. So let me just end perhaps by going back to that historical note today that I began with. Um, fortunately, the son of the deposed dictator 
Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is now the president of my country, and he was there at the UNGA um, to speak, right? So I think what does, I have to say, what does this tell us? I think it tells us that struggles for justice could be protracted. They could be long-running struggles, but you know, we should continue the struggle because we know what is at stake. What is at stake is people-centered development and genuinely sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rodolfo, and also for putting all these global challenges, but also without forgetting all the, the importance at, at national levels of our private sector. Ahora, me gustaría invitar a Claudio Fernandez. Now I would like to invite Claudio Fernandez from Hestas, Brazil. Claudio is becoming more important every time, uh, it's becoming more and more evident every time that democracy is uh, some of the main challenges that we're facing in the light of a new process for development. Claudio, you can have the floor, please. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll speak in English. History into the play. I'm going to bring some history as well as an introduction. The first of two major events uh, that were based upon two great lies. One big lie who can for the people that are younger, they don't recall that, but that was the fear that all computers would just crash because the year would turn from 1999 to 2000. To prevent that, but some of those money did not back to else. In the second right, was the weapons of mass destruction that justified mm -hmm. the invasion of Iraq by the US in the uh, events. Okay, as important as well, kind of puts us civil society organizations in, into a different field of battle, let's put it this way. We can manage and negotiate from now on institutions and with the people uh, in these institutions to try and change and make the systemic, the systemic reforms that we talked about so much, not only financial and economic reforms, but social, cultural, gender-based or other reforms that expands inequality. So the two reasons that actually kind of shocked me in my interpretation, one was, uh, of course, the pandemic and the unfolding of the pandemic that revealed extreme position of bad faith on the leadership of many countries in the world and mostly of all private sectors in the production of necessary use for the vaccines and for treatment of uh, the COVID-19. And now we still have 22% only of the whole continent of Africa being vaccinated. Meanwhile, the leaders of uh, countries declare the end of the pandemic, which is not real. And the second event actually that shocked me a lot was the rise of the fascist culture as a normal process that created a situation of a cultural war that exacerbated that bad faith, particularly with a lot of investment from the private sector. A lot of the private sector, particularly the oligopolies and monopolies of this world, have supported the rise of fascism in our many countries. Okay, so then, what, and what we have? We have a financial dictatorship that has established a neo-colonial situation. Now we don't have a dictator like Ferdinand Marcos. We have an elected son of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines with all support from the business sector and the communication sector as well. And that's for economy, right? Under the banner of somewhat of a political democracy, but it's actually sustaining a financial dictatorship that puts all countries in a lot of burden, particularly related to the austerity policies that have been enacted in these countries since the beginning of the century. I would like to recall that since the year 2000, 
austerity has been on the table in every policy making in developing countries, except for a very small window of opportunity that happened in Latin America during the left wave in the first decade of this century. Anyway, so how can we fight financial dictatorship and wealth concentration with economic democracy? We need progressive taxation, tax justice, and we've been talking about this for so long. We need partnership and cooperation, but an effective partnership and cooperation, particularly using some of those funds from the uh, ODA that right now is being diverted to secure and de-risk private sector, instead of going precisely to the, to the people responsible for the implementation and the of the implementation of the 2030 agenda is us, civil society organization movement. And we keep falling on the trap of need financial resources and the financial resource is very meager for the civil society organization. We need to change that script, the action for development, uh, sustainable development campaign says, we need to change the script of the flow of capital. We need resources for the main implementers of the sustainable development agenda. And uh, for instance, in Brazil, there's an example, which is the civil society network for the 2030 agenda that has consistently now for six years produced a spotlight report on the implementation or in the case of the non-implementation of the 2030 agenda. It's extremely important. It's the only report that's been produced in a country with more than 200 million people with a complete disregard by the government towards the agenda. So to conclude, I'd like to call us, our colleagues, ourselves, to really define our field of battle because we are in war. The rise of fascism shows that private capital really has a major disregard for nation building, for community building, and for peace because we have a buildup of military and we have a buildup of financing, sustaining that buildup of military. So we have real war and we have a cultural war that has been sustained by a lot of lies, including the Chicago boy lies that says that, oh, the market is there and we have to sustain the market. And for that, we have to strangle our societies with austerity policy. That's the biggest lie of all. And I would like us, to rebel and to raise against all this life. And particularly at the FFD4 conference that we're demanding and we hope the General Assembly would approve, will approve. And with that you know, spirit, we should approach the FFD4 with the aspect that now is the time of reckoning and we have to look eye in eye with the leadership and the policymakers of this world. Time has come to really put the money where the mouth is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudio, for those very important inputs uh, and uh, for that view that also reflect all our concerns. Uh, well, we don't have Vitalis in the call, but the, the, the topic that he was going to address is very important and specifically about what is the situation of the International Development Corporation development effectiveness. And this was one of the key commitments back there in Monterey, in the Monterey consensus. So I would like, and I really appreciate, I would like to invite Matthew Simmons from the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness to take a few minutes and step in in the panel and give us uh, some inputs and a brief idea of what is the status and the challenges on this topic. Thank you, Matthew, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Patricia. And sorry, uh, sorry, Meja is not here to join us. Um, I did not have anything prepared. Um, so I'll just try to pick up uh, some of the things that actually um, Rodolfo and, and Claudia have already sort of alluded to with respect to sort of public financing and the role of international development cooperation. Um, we have, uh, as Patricia's noted, dating back to Monterey, kind of the uh, origins of what's called the effectiveness agenda um, and really um, effective development cooperation. Um, this agenda is, is underpinned by, by four principles. Um, some of the things that I think we would all kind of as a global community agree are important. Um, first of those is, is 
democratic ownership. So, so national development strategies that are owned um, by the countries themselves, but also people in those countries. Um, transparency and accountability, um, and really transparency about the flows of public and having an accountability of how those resources are used. Um, uh, a focus on development results, and really that there's uh, the, the outcomes are aligned to now the broad sustainable development agenda and results that, that, are, that are also aligned with that agenda. And then lastly, and possibly most important for, for, for us as CSOs is, is a focus on inclusiveness and inclusive development partnerships. Um, and there, um, all the conditions that need to be in place to allow uh, for CSOs and civil society to assert itself and, and uh, perform as a partner, development actor in its own right. Um, this year is uh, a, a sort of milestone event on the, the effectiveness agenda. Um, there is a the third high level meeting of um, this sort of international partnership called the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, uh, and, um, and it will be looking at you know some of the sort of key themes that are um, being discussed by this community. Um, some of them, I think, have already been alluded to and some that we've pushed back on quite a bit. Um, yeah, it will be a uh, kind of sort of trying to reinvent and re revitalize this, this agenda post COVID and, and uh, after the pandemic, or well, I guess we're still in the pandemic, but um, uh, let's say going forward for the future. Um, those themes really, um, we have um, a look at uh, sort of the overall implementation of, of the effective development principles, but uh, importantly, we'll be looking at, at the, the role of um, and be looking at also the accountability of the private sector and ensuring that private sector entities kind of adhere to, to standing uh, international standards and human rights norms. Um, it will be looking at also um, uh, coherent and inclusive responses to, to situations of conflict and crisis, and especially uh, in, in the post-pandemic world. And then finally looking at the uh, trying to apply principles to climate finance versus climate finance principles to, to international development cooperation. Um, so I think if I were to just kind of introduce the, the topic that way. I don't really have anything in addition to, uh, to that, but I'm happy to hear um, from other colleagues uh, on, on these issues as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matt, and also for um, agreeing to step in, uh, in, the, in the very last minute. And thanks for all the inputs you have brought, because also that brings the opportunity to have our next panelist, and I'm going to switch to Spanish now. Y tengo el, el enorme placer de presentar ahora a... And I would like to introduce our colleague, Ala Emilia from Gender Equity Mexico, and from the Women's Task Force for Development. Amelia has been in this process for many years. She's been a spokeswoman from the South. And Amelia, after listening to all of this information, what do you think is the current scenario that we're facing? What is this urgency that we have? What, why is this the moment? for the 2030 agenda, the climate change agenda. So, Emilia, what's the current scenario? What should we be worried about? And what's your advice? And by the way, which roles should we take? Thank you, Emilia. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you in this uh, people's, uh, Global People's um, Assembly, especially now when we see that there is a shrinking space all over the world. Uh, just wanted to say some things. Uh, I think all of the speakers have been great in emphasizing the relevance of an FFD for conference at the moment in this uh, very dire times. I just want to emphasize as well that uh, 
the environmental emergency is really, really pressing, uh, not only talking about the climate change emergency, but really the entire, the entire environmental integrity agenda. And it is totally to our economic system. So just wanted to make a plea out here for people to understand that the FFD agenda is not about getting more money, more money for education, more money for health, more money for civil society. It's about the, the, the normative dimension of the financial system, about how we can change of how the flows uh, happen throughout the world, uh, across the world, and how these dynamics, these normative dynamics shift towards a very, a very concentration of wealth that has uh, in turn a terrible impact of people and in the health of the planet. So this is something I really want to emphasize because we are calling for an FFD conference because as I say, as I say in many spaces, we are losing, we are fighting in isolation, in silos for each of the tracks uh, that we deem relevant in our lives. And now it's time for a cross-movement cross mobilization to emphasize the priorities that lie in fighting for structural agendas for the key systemic pillars that are moving the dynamics around the world and that so far have been shifting towards the concentration of wealth, the elites, and as many of my colleagues have mentioned already, to Ill illegitimate spaces of power that are shaping now multilateralism at the moment. So this is also a bet for a democratic multilateral system to rescue a multilateral system that is very much needed now nowadays. And this is why calling for an effort Key when people are betting to attending CCC climate change, thinking that there could be a solution that is not uh, that is really far from the truth. I mean, the mandate of the UNFCCC is extremely limited, and there is a very strong refusal to talk about fossil fuels, and we know that the origin of the problem. One of the origins of the problem is, for instance, the, the financial and the banking systems that are pouring trillions into fossil fuels industries. So we know that in the end, we need to go back to the root of the problems. We need to go back to the system, to the systemic uh, trends that we are seeing. We need to go back to analyzing all of these um, concentration of power as well, and to recognize that northern countries uh, the global North countries are responsible for 93% per of the carbon emissions in the entire world, and they're responsible for 73% of the material resource use in the world. That means that the global North is at this point responsible for putting uh, our life at stake, the planet, the of humanity on this planet, and that is due to the capitalistic and neoliberal system that is taking us to all of these inequalities. So just wanted to emphasize as well from this environmental dimension that being, an, being in an environmental agenda at this point means being against the neoliberal extractive capitalistic system that we have. And so the fight and the need to addressing these that my colleagues have mentioned so far, we need to uh, map out all of these points of entry that are key for improving the lives of people and the planet. Second, to align ourselves behind the demands and push towards them. And three, to go beyond a very simplistic understanding of what is an economic agenda? And I say again, it's not about getting more money. So, because that is a perverse discourse that the SDGs uh, arena has been bringing, right? About bringing from billion to trillions, about bringing more money, the more funding of the private sector. And many civil society fall into that trap that is a perverse trap in saying we need more money for this sector or this another. No, the money is there. We just need to shift the inadequate, the perverse 
uh, regulations that are prioritizing the over people on the planet. So our call for an FFD conference is really key. And so the call to to start a cross movement action. And second, um, if if I may say to do it in a it's start responsible their governments, their authorities, you are citizens of the most powerful actors in the world who are precisely undermining legitimate spaces like the UN and going into the other illegitimate spaces of power like the G20, G7, the Paris Club, etc., OECD. So you, we need you to challenge that. And we need you also to challenge the obscene bullying that happens inside the UN by these rich actors with the G77, with the seeds, with the LDCs, because we've seen them that precisely the agenda of cooperation is one of the tools that they use to to threaten them and to say, I won't give you this program. We saw that with the votes in, in the Russian war, how uh, vaccines programs were removed once uh, they were not uh, in a clear alignment with the Western agendas, etc. So we cannot let that happen. A civil society very close in monitoring uh, the UN. We need to stand up and we need to confront these powers and these voices because we don't want to be naive in saying that an FFD conference is going to solve everything if we do not do our work. And we need to do a differentiated work. We in the global south need to uh, stand behind uh, progressive voices and trying to push for the most strongest agenda that can push really other groups that may not be so clear in their positions, but the developed countries and the citizens in developed countries, the INGOs, you have a very key role in now in stepping in being bolder, in being more radical, in being clear that this moment we have a historical role to play and that is saving humanity and saving life in this planet and recovering the dignity for people on the planet. So this is why on the one hand, we're calling for a global decision like a conference of crisis that can pull in all of these debates that are so key to solving all of the major challenges that humanity is facing under one same roof. But at the same time, we are calling on to you to assume a real responsibility to step out of your comfort zone and your own silos discourses and to engage, first of all, in a normative, structural, systemic discussion. And second, to challenge power and to bring in the victory on the right side of history. We say that people's power is more and more powerful than corporate power, than fascist power. And this is a very historical time to prove it. So this is the call for the FFD group, the Women's Working Group uh, on Financing for Development. And hopefully we can bring in to, uh, to a success in, in this fight if we are all doing it together. So thank you very much for, for gathering in this very relevant conversation. Thank you so much, Emilia, for all these, very, uh, for all your words, for putting us into the ground, but also giving us all the landscape. What do we need to do as CSO? We have heard today what is at stake. What are the challenges? What are the key transformations that we need towards the, the accomplishment of the FFD commitments, but not only to accomplish the Monterey consen consensus and the spirit that spirit 20 years ago, but also to go beyond. And the current crisis is bringing on the table so many other issues that we need to put in the FFD process. I encourage you all today, besides thanking you for being connected to this event, I encourage you all today to spread the word of what we have heard to different stakeholders at national, regional, and global levels, in the North and in the South, that here from the People's Global Assembly, we make a call, a strong call for an FFD4 with a participative process for CSOs. Today, in a context of multiple crises, we need the political will towards urgent global and transformative economic policies the link that could link the FFD process with 
the SDG and the climate agendas and all that we have heard today in this event. Thank you so much to our fantastic and brilliant panelists and to, to all the participants today. Thank you so much and this event is finished. Thank you all. Thank you. Are we having a Hello. picture, a group picture group or anything to the organizers? Oh. Rose, can you